Okay. Okay. And Terry, you're good? I'm great. You're good. Okay. All right. Yep. Okay. It is Wednesday, July 8th, and we are picking up mm -hmm. in a brand new study entitled Daniel's 70th Week. This is a, a week that opens us up to thousands of years of prophecy. And we are going to look in depth at what it means, what it's saying to us today, but more importantly, in uh, in uh, the well, it's speaking to Daniel's people. So we want to see it in its who it was meant for. You know, I'm having a rough start. It's meant for all of us, but you know what I'm trying to say. I think so. I'm just going to bypass, pray that my brain engages. And just get us into the Word of God. May may the Holy Spirit be our our teacher. May it flow from His throne to your hearts and mine also. Daniel is a, a Bible character that I cannot wait to meet. I want you to realize you are studying a message that was given to a real person. He got up in the morning and had to get dressed and had to eat breakfast just like the rest of us. But we're taking a man who, at a very young age, probably approximately 16 years of age, was uprooted, taken out of his home, taken away from his parents, taken out of his homeland, forced march for a long distance, brought into the king's palace, which could be considered a privilege, and it was in comparison to those who went into a world of harsh slavery, but at the same time, it had its pitfalls there. And the king wanted to indulge Daniel and all of his choice brethren that had been picked for this position with all the wealth and all the best that Babylon had to offer. The problem was, number one, the diet wasn't kosher. Number two, the gods that they were being introduced to were stone, were idolatrous. They were not among them even, the one true and living God. Everything that Daniel had been raised up in to know was being stripped from him, even to the very fact they wanted to take his name from him. His name means my God is judge. He stayed faithful to his God. He uh, walked it, talked it, literally ate it, slept it, breathed it, lived it, and God honored him. I believe that you're all familiar with Daniel, so I won't say any more than that, but I want to bring into your mind who we are dealing with in this chapter today. Daniel was before the Lord praying. Many of us are before the Lord praying, but there's something key in his prayer because he's pleading for his people. He didn't just come into the prayer for himself, yet there's nothing wrong with bringing ourselves into prayer. I need prayer. I'll lift myself up asking for prayer. <laughs> but we are realizing that he had such a heart burden for his people. We know that, that he, even as he saw and knew and understood the prophecy of time, he knew when it was going to be about time for them to be released from the captivity, to go back to the land. And he brought that to God's attention. Not that God is forgetful, but because he had that right to enter into that covenant with his God and say, here it is, Lord. You said it. Now please perform it. Daniel, in the beginning in chapter 9, verse 2, it's in the first year of uh, the reign of Darius. Um, this is when Medo-Persia has, has come up now over Babylon. And Daniel observed in the books the number of the years which was revealed as the word of the Lord to Jeremiah the prophet for the completion of the desolations of Jerusalem, namely 70 years. Wow, I just gave you a whole time twister to tell you. Daniel read, Jeremiah the prophet had a good Jewish mind and said, Hmm, God, Jeremiah, he's our prophet. And he talked about this time and he said 70 years and it would come to an end. And uh, I'm, I'm looking at my clock and we've been here about 70 years. So let's get the show on the road. <laughs> How many of us feel that way also? Yeah. Yet he gave his attention to the Lord. That's what it tells us in verse 3. This is what I love about him. He was seeking the Lord by prayer and supplications of fasting, sackcloth, and ashes. Pray to the Lord my God and confess. And if we had time to go into it, we won't because we want to focus on the 70th week. But if we had time, we would see how he brought the sins of his people to his God. Not to say, look at so-and-so and I'm living a better life. His heart was broken for his people and he was pleading for forgiveness. He was confessing the sins of the people. He was taking the role of prophet, representing the people to God 
and being a representative from God to the people. And in this, he is considered someone very righteous. Um, he says his, the righteousness belongs to the Lord in verse 7, that we're going to see he was favored. And that's why the Lord gave him the prophecy that he did. God saw his heart, saw who his character was, and met him in a way that is phenomenal, that spoke to Daniel's heart. We're in, uh, let's just round it off and just say approximately 500 B.C. Now we're in 2000 A.D., so we're talking 2,500 years. And do you know that prophecy still is as relevant today as it was then? That what was given to Daniel was such an overview through time that it gives us the hope we have today of the coming future. It gave hope back in, in the B.C. time, in the A.D. time. It gave hope even when our Lord left this earth after living his earthly life and was ascended into heaven. I can't imagine the emptiness for the Talmudian left behind that had spent three and a half years in intensive side-by-side uh, -side working and studying and learning from the Messiah himself. Wow. But now Messiah has gone back into heaven, has told them the Holy Spirit would come upon them, and they would be empowered to do his work. They needed to know the future also. And we know they asked questions like Daniel that tie in. Matthew 24 is going to tie into Daniel 9. If you've been with me, you know these two chapters go hand in hand together. That we look at both of them when we're studying them. And we know that as we come closer and closer, and I'm going to say it, we are in strange days and strange times. We're living in a pandemic. We're living in the, something that has affected the entire surface of the world. I think for the first time in ages that this is true in the way that it is, in the depth that it is. It's new in my lifetime. We've heard of catastrophes in different places, but this is something that's worldwide. Yeah. What do we read about the coming time that is worldwide? Those who scoffed and said nothing could affect the whole world, nothing could pull the United States down, nothing could change this or that, are now having to second guess their thoughts. And maybe are a little more willing to take a look at what the Word of God says. Because what we're experiencing, I fully believe, is a birth pain. Yes. And any of you who've had babies, and any of you who haven't, not leaving you men out, <laughs> it's not hard to understand that those birth pains get stronger and stronger yes as the baby is ready to be delivered. And if we call the tribulation time the delivery, then we know that we have moved into a closer. We've had a birth pain here. We're feeling it. It's affecting. And Daniel in his time was feeling birth pains also. You'd say, well, how can that be? How can it be so long? Because there was near fulfillment and there was far fulfillment. There were things that were happening and shaping his world then in relation to these scriptures, but the greater we know goes all the way down to today. And we're seeing it come alive in a way I've never seen it before. We're understanding the book of Revelation even more than when we studied it. We didn't get done studying that long ago, did we? And if I could go back and teach a, a few places again, in light of what we've experienced today, it lifts it right off the page. That's, that's the word of God. It's not a book that's ancient. It's a book that is present. It is alive. It is sharp. It is like a two-edged sword. It cuts through everything. It lays it on the bottom line. And Daniel is going to record for us these prophetic words that are going to affect our world, that already we're seeing the remblance, but it's going to affect it all the more in the very, very near future. I have to sidestep for one split second. My air conditioning came on. Is that too noisy for the hearing? It is. Okay. Roger? Go ahead, Maria. Is who muted? Is who muted? Everybody. Yeah, see, can you turn the air? It's, oh, they can't hear. Everyone is muted. Are you getting feedback, Maria? No, no. It's, it, I think it was the air. It's okay. It, it came on and, you know, it cycled. We didn't expect it. So it's taking a minute to go off, but uh, I'll wait to start back in the notes. Because you know, we are hearing water being filled and uh, the microwave being turned on and uh, things like that in the background. Just 
Okay, it's not here, so somebody's not muted somewhere. <laughs> I'm glad you tell me because I we want everybody to be able to hear. So when there's a problem, you can red flag me. I can see. And by the way, since I have this moment and need to, and forgive those who have to listen to this later, um, and they, they won't appreciate this part, but. Um, Am I too little? <laughs> you you got to understand, I hate the camera. I don't want to remember them on camera. I want one-on-one -on -one with each of you. I want to see you. But there has been, um, I don't know if I call it complaint, that I'm dinky and little. And so Roger had pushed everything up real close, and I told him it was too close. I, I couldn't breathe. <laughs> so, am I too little? Thumbs up. Yep. No. Okay. So I'm good with everybody? Okay. Okay. All right. Because I think it's important enough, just like when we're in person, we need to see people's facial yes. expressions. It helps us understand. When I teach and can't see you, I wonder, are you hearing? Are you getting it? Do you understand if I communicate mm -hmm. it? So I don't want you feeling that lack of connection also, but I'm going to trust all is good. Our air is off. Is the quality of sound better? Better? Okay. All right. We're going to go again then, and we're going to hopefully not have any problem. <laughs> so before I just stay too long-winded, let's go ahead and just keep looking at Chapter 9. And we know that, that Daniel's been crying out to um, his Lord. He's asking questions. He's wondering what's going on. Isn't it time? Shouldn't there be changes happening now? What is going on? And he, at the same time, is confessing the sins of his people, praying for forgiveness, praying for God's mercy. These are all lessons we can learn. That's why I preface it with all of this. We can learn from everything that he was saying and he was doing that we might also be mediators, that we might be priests trying to represent people to our God also, pleading for that mercy to come to one and all. But to focus on Daniel's 70th week, on where we were at, we really need to start with verse 20. And then we'll quickly pick up in verse 24 where we'll go line by line, word by word. But to give us that background, Daniel is the one speaking. He says, Now while I was speaking and praying and confessing my sin and the sin of my people. And by the way, for the sake of the new ones who have come in today, when he refers to my people, who are Daniel's people? Israel. Israel, the Jewish people, the Jewish nation. He's not talking about the Chaldeans who he is living among. He's not talking about Medo-Persia who has come up on, on the head to be where in the image of uh, Nebuchadnezzar's dream we're into the silver, the uh, shoulders, the Medo-Persia. That's why there were two shoulders. But he's not speaking about them. He's coming to his God who he knows from the Tanakh. Well, actually from the Torah, I have to say, because he's part of what the Tanakh is made up of. His book that is written. The Torah are the first five books of what you call your Old Testament, what I call the original scriptures, and they are speaking also of God. They're speaking also of his Messiah. They're giving us what we need to know also. Daniel also had some of the, the what we call the prophets today. He had the scroll of Yeremia, what Yeremia had written, Jeremiah, and he had learned from that the 70 years that they would be in captivity. So he knew it's time, and he's pleading before God to understand and to uh, beg that forgiveness from God. And let, you know, we've suffered the consequences of what sent us into this captivity, which was idolatry, which was not uh, uh, keeping the Shabbat for the Lamb. It was not following the commandments of God. Now he's, he's pleading. He's presenting a supplication before the Lord my God in behalf of the holy mountain of my God. The holy mountain, the mountain is the kingdom of my God. That's, that's recognizing that his God is the supreme God. While I was still speaking in prayer, this is verse 21. Then the man Gabriel, Gabriel in our English, whom I had seen in the vision previously. This is the same one, if you follow the book of Daniel, who had come and spoken to him before. He's come again, came to me in my extreme weariness. Remember, he's fasting, and he's praying, and he's supplicating. Supplicating is when you are crying out from the depths of your soul unto your God. This is the heaving of his soul. He is worn out. 
in his wanting to be interceding for his people, in his wanting favor with his God, in him crying for release from the captivity, for God to, to in his mercy reach out. And it has worn him out. He is weary. It's about the time of the evening offering. Notice how Daniel is still thinking. Remember, he's not in Israel. Where can they make those offerings and those sacrifices? In Israel. They would be making them at the temple. They wouldn't be making them in the land of Chaldea, in the Babylonian um, area, even though Medo-Persia is taken over. They're still where they were taken off, carried into captivity. But you notice, almost 70 years later, and he is still remembering that there's morning sacrifices and prayers. There's noontime sacrifices and prayers. Now it was about the time that if he was in his own land, he would be making that evening offering. He has not left behind his Jewishness. He has not forgotten who he is and who his God is and who God was speaking to when he promised that release of captivity. So... Gabriel comes to him about the time of the evening offering, and he gave me instruction in verse 22. He talked with me, and he said, O oh, Daniel, I have now come forth to give you insight with understanding. I don't know about you, but the word out of my mouth would have been, Hallelujah! <laughs> this is a breakthrough. I'm going to get my answer. But notice, it's not just going to give me insight, which I'm thankful for the insight, but with understanding. That's gold. That's gold. If any of you lack wisdom, let him ask of God. When you're asking and you're praying and you're interceding and you want these answers to come, be sure and pray and seek for understanding to come with, to know what to do with it, how to apply it, what it all means. This was, this is, you're getting the whole enchilada and you're getting to eat it too. <laughs> so he's going to be now given that insight with understanding. And the, the angel goes on speaking in verse 23, at the beginning of your supplications, at the beginning of that time of crying it out, the command was issued. I have come to tell you. So what was the command? The command was for Gabriel, go. Go talk to Daniel. Go tell him. Go give him insight and give him understanding. And he's letting Daniel know, you're receiving this because you are highly esteemed. He was looked upon as one who was standing right before God. God was saying, you are my precious servant. You are doing what I have called you to do. I'm going to honor you. I'm going to bless you. You are going to receive answer to your supplications. I have come to tell you to give heed to the message and to get understanding of the vision. And here is the vision now and the understanding that will come with it. Verse 24. Seventy weeks have been decreed for your people and your holy city. And then it's going to list several things that are going to happen. I'll read through them, then we'll go back and we'll break it down phrase by phrase. To finish the transgression, make an end of sin, make atonement for iniquity, bring in everlasting righteousness, seal up the vision, and prophesy to anoint the most holy place. Wow! He's just been given a whole, whole lot. And I did put my phone on silent, but for whatever reason, it popped off. Okay, it's back on silent. He's going to be given insight and understanding to a whole lot. And I've already tipped me in and told you that it covers more than 2,500 years because we're still counting. Let's go see. Let's back up. Let's tear it apart. Um, or as David Jeremiah says it, and I love it, let's unpack it. I love to unpack and find all the jewels. Okay, 70 weeks. Now, I've already introduced you to the fact that Daniel was a good Jewish boy, that he was being raised in his Jewishness, and he didn't walk away from it. When he went off into captivity, he took it with him, and he lived it every day of his life. We have to remember that he is Jewish. He is going to get him going. Oh, okay, let's try that again. He is going to be referring to what's going to happen to his people, which are the Jewish people, the nation of Israel. So we have to understand and remember and stay in that line of thinking. So what does 70 weeks mean in Hebrew? Literally what we have is 70 sevens. It means 70 periods of seven years. Now this is what's called, from others, if you hear them say them, it's called Oriental language. It doesn't mean Japan, but the uh, Near Eastern area was called the Orient at that time. And this was the way that, that uh, they spoke then. 
Uh, Aramaic, was, or Aramaic was a language. It flows into Hebrew. And in that, we go back to the roots of the languages. We go back to the etymology of the words to get the full understanding. And in Hebrew, it can be weeks, it can be years, it can be different meanings. But our context will help us understand. If I took you to a couple other places, you would see where the same Hebrew words are used with different meanings. If I took you to Bereshit, to Genesis, the very beginning, I took you to chapter 29, you can look it up later, verses 27 to 30. This is where Yaakov, Jacob, is working uh, seven years for his bride. And then he has to complete the marriage week with the one he got, who wasn't who he wanted, so that he could get the one he wanted, but he's going to work another seven years for her, for Rachel, for Rachel. I'm telling you the story of Leah and Rachel, how they came to be both Yaakov's wives. If you look at the original language, you will see that it's talking about a week, and it's talking about years, and it's using the same word. Let me take you to Leviticus, Viacra, chapter 25. And we're going to see there also, in fact, that one, let's go ahead and turn to that one together so that you know I'm giving you the Word of God to understand the Word of God. We're going to look at Leviticus. Uh, chapter 25, and we'll look at verse 3 initially. Leviticus is Viacra in our Hebrew. Chapter 25. Yay, it worked. Okay. And verse 3 says, Six years you shall sow your field, and six years you shall prune your vineyard and gather in its drop. But during this seventh year, the land shall have a Shabbat rest, a Sabbath to the Lord. You shall, so, now, you shall not sow your field nor prune your vineyard. Okay, now if we got into the original, we would see that they were not leaving the land fallow for a week. They were leaving it for a year. But it, the word used is a seven in there. Shabbat is even has that in it. Um, not that Shabbat is seven, but it also, the root comes from this. Drop down to verse eight. You were to count off seven Shabbats of years. Okay, seven sheva, Shabbats of Shabbos for yourself. Seven times seven years so that you have the time of the seven Sabbaths of years, namely, and it explains it in case if you're lost, 49 years. Basically, they did seven times seven to come to 49 years. Then it tells them what they're to do in the, the seventh year in verse 9. Uh, verse 10 tells them the 50th year, the year of Jubilee. So we see that we're getting into language that helps us understand that we have to look at the context to know what it means. So Viagra is showing us that a week of seven years, seven times, is going to be 49 years. So when we take that and we go back into Daniel and we look at 70 weeks or 70 periods of sevens, now we know that we're looking at 490 years. We're looking at periods of seven years, we'll see it in that context, before these things would happen. The iniquity of his people being pardoned, <clears throat> the final deliverance being accomplished. Because from the start to the end of what we read in verse 24, that's the two targets there, the beginning and the end of it. So, a period of 77s, a period of 490 years, has been decreed, has been determined, has been fixed, has been decided, settled on, marked out for the Jewish people. When it says thy people, Daniel's people, your people, it's the Jewish people. So what is the holy city to the Jewish people? I think that's an easy one for us to answer, is it not? Jerusalem, Jerusalem. There isn't any other city considered holy to the Jewish people. And we know it's considered that because God put his name on it and he decreed it to be his holy city. That's why it's so important that we understand who Jerusalem belongs to. And why Satan has gone after it with a vengeance through the world to try to strip Israel away from it. Because he does not want it to be Messiah's uh, city. And that is exactly what it is. So, this period of time is, coming, uh, is being decreed on the Jewish people and on Jerusalem. Okay, that means I love you dear Gentiles, but this isn't your prophecy. This is prophecy for the Jewish people. That doesn't mean it won't affect you, doesn't mean it won't touch you, doesn't mean you should oh hum and not care. <laughs> but it is specifically for the Jewish people and uh, in relation to Jerusalem. So what is it? What is it saying? 
finish the transgression. That's the first phrase that is given in, in our understanding of the Hebrew words there is to complete it, to restrain it, to confine it, to stop it, to cease it. Okay? They had been for 70 years living through the transgression of their sins. The transgression is the sin. There was a payment for it. Remember, God does not just wink at sin. He does not let it go uh, without there being a, a, a judgment for it. They were told because they had not given the land its Shabbat that God was going to give it to them all at once. They had missed from the time of Melch David, King David, to the time when Daniel went into captivity. They had missed all of those seven-year Shabbats for the land. It totaled 70 times they should have done it, and so God said, okay, 70 years, this is going to be on your people. That land is going to get to lie fallow. When the Jewish people were stripped from their land, the land was denuded, and that, that uh, dirt, that ground, got its rest. Not in the way that it should have, but in the way that God determined it, because they were suffering the consequences of their disobedience to their God. So to finish the transgression would be ending the, the 70 years of captivity. Now, hold on, those of you who know there's a future going on here too. Remember I said that there is a near fulfillment, there's a greater fulfillment. We're going to see that there's more to come than just stopping it in Don, Daniel's day. But this is when the age of obedience was to begin. This was when, and we just studied it last week, Romans 11:26 tells them that all of Israel would be saved, all of Israel would be delivered. This would be the time when Israel would be saying, Baruch Baba Hashem Adonai, blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. So this time that is being referred to at the end of the iniquity of the people, the end of their transgression, the end of their sin, would also usher in this age of obedience, this time when Israel would be delivered. Now, we know that has not happened, so we know now that we're not just looking at in Daniel's day, because had it been just in Daniel's day, then there would have been an answer, and all these other things would have happened also. But we know it's still stretching further. It will happen, but we will see its fullness and the timing of it as we move along. The second part after the finish, the transgression, in my uh, version, it says to make an end of sin. Seal up sin. We're talking about the national sins of Israel. Remember, this is the time Israel is going to turn back to her God and become obedient to her God again. And her sins will have been atoned for. They'll be expiated. We can see that in Romans 11, 26, and 27 that I just alluded to. Let me also take you to Hezekiel, Ezekiel chapter 37. We'll probably stop off at Romans on our way back since I'm making you look it up. I'm going to give you good finger exercise in your Bibles today. Ezekiel chapter 37, Hezekiel is another one of our prophets uh, in the Tanakh who spoke to these end times also. And in chapter 37, verse 23 is the verse we want to look at. And it says, They will no longer defile themselves with their idols. Remember, Israel had allowed idolatry into the land. Or with their detestable things, or with any of their transgressions that I will deliver them from all their dwelling places in which they have sinned and will cleanse them. They will be my people, and I will be their God. And again, that's a hallelujah. That's what we know was to come and will fully come yet in a day in the future because it has not been 100% fulfilled yet today. This is a time when Satan will be restrained when he will not have freedom to work the iniquity into that land that he has been known for. Let's go to Romans 11. And while we're going there, remember since we just finished several weeks of study, Romans 9, 10, and 11, let me just remind you very quickly. Romans 9, Israel past. Romans 10, Israel present. Romans 11, Israel future. And as we look in chapter 11, we see the grafting in of who? This is where I wish we had feedback. We've got the grafting in of the dear Gentiles. We've got those that are being brought in, into that one new man, to be fellowshiped, to be united in the Lord, equal with the Jewish people. And yet those Gentiles who are coming in are told, don't boast, that, well, look at us, we're great, we're brought in, you're out, 
No, it's not that Israel is out. She is not fulfilling her priestly duties. So God has raised another people to perform those duties to make her jealous. Remember? Remember how Paul said, I'm working even harder to save more Gentiles because the more that I do that, the more jealous my Jewish people will be for it and they'll want it and they'll come back in. And God brings in this unity that, that both are there together, one family united in the Lord, that he promises Israel in particular. Just remember we're talking, talking about Israel past, present, future. Verse 26 says the deliverer will come from Zion, from Jerusalem. Zion is a mountain in Jerusalem. He will remove ungodliness, sin, from Yaakov. Yaakov is the one that was named Israel. We're talking about the entire Israel nation. We're not talking about just Jacob. We're talking about the nation. This is my covenant, God speaking with them. Who is the them? The same them that we've got in, in Daniel's prophecy. With the Jews, with Israel. This is my covenant when I take away their sins. Does that sound like what Daniel's talking about? Yes. That's what they're both talking about. We hear it in Daniel. We hear it in Hezekiel. We hear it in Romans. We see it in Revelation in living color. Okay. This is what's being referred to. Staying with Daniel's prophecy. And again, we're going to break more of this down and come to timing and all of that as we move on. But the next phrase that is given then is to make reconciliation for iniquity. That means that there has to be an atonement. There has to be a purging away of the sins. Again, they cannot just be covered forever. They have got to be purged. They've got to be removed. How was this done? This was done by the shed blood of the innocent, the perfect Lamb of God, who said that he had come to take away the sin of the world. That's why you Gentiles have just as much comfort in this as the Jewish people. The target here that we're being told is the Jews, but the Gentiles were never left out. Salvation for them, same way, the shed blood of Yeshua, the sacrificial lamb of God. That is how anyone is saved anytime from Adam to July 8, 2020 AD to however long we go into the future. Let me show you that this is talking about when the Jewish people finally have that veil of blindness removed from their eyes and they're seeing and they're hearing and they're understanding who their Messiah is. You've heard this scripture from me many a time, but I've got to take you through it again because it's critical for us to understand what's being referred to in the book of Daniel. And it's going to our prophet Zechariah. We're taking a walk through the prophets today. I love our prophets. I love what they have told and what they are telling. And uh, this one is one of my favorite verses. I see our whole triunity, our whole God, God the Father, Yehovah, God the Son, Yeshua, God the Ruch HaKodesh, the Holy Spirit, all three in this verse. The same way all three were involved in the moment of creation for us, and I say that because in the creation of the world as we know it today, that we're given in Bereshit, and we will go back to Genesis when we can bring everyone together again. We will get back there. But we saw in the first two verses the triune God who was involved. That God who was involved in the creation of this entire world that he's gifted to us is the God who's being referred to here, who is the God, the living God of Abraham, Yitzhak, and Yaakov, of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. And he is the one speaking, saying, I will pour out. On, did I tell you verse 10? If not, it's verse 10 of Zechariah 12. I will pour out on the house of David, the house of David, on the inhabitants of Jerusalem. Jerusalem. Okay, if I stop right there and I tested you and I asked you, who's this prophecy for? Who's this about? If you say anything other than the Jewish people, Jerusalem, comma, Israel, I have to give you a failing grade because it's right here in black and white. It's not left for us to wonder. It's not left for us to come up with a, another answer. It is given to us very clearly. God is saying he is going to pour out on the house of David. He's going to pour out on Jerusalem. Remember, Jerusalem is his holy city. It's where he put his name. Why is it called the house of David? Because David was the, the, the great king of Israel. David was Melch David, King David, who promises were given to that are for all time. That if we went back to the prophet Shmuel, Samuel in his second writing to us in our book, in the, the Jewish uh, Bibles went long, in chapter 7, we have where uh, 
Yeah, Second Samuel 7. We have where it's taught that there will always be one sitting on David's throne. That Messiah would come through the loins of David, and that this is who would be on his throne, seated forever. That it would come from the tribe of Judah. Well, we know Messiah fulfilled all of this, and we will see him sitting on his throne before we get done with this prophecy here. That that is what is coming. So, this is very Jewish, and now we've got another witness. Remember, if we take a thing into court, we take in witnesses. Well, I've just given you Ezekiel, Daniel, Zachariah, Shaol Paul, and Yochanan when we get to Revelation. I've given you five, and I could give you more, but I think I'm winning my case. So, moving on. On this particular, on Jerusalem, on the inhabitants of Jerusalem, the house of David, I will pour out the Spirit, okay? Yehovah speaking. Now he's saying, I'm going to pour out the Ruch HaKodesh. You see your two parts? And remember, they're one equal, the great mystery. The spirit of grace. Oh, how I thank God for his yes. grace. Where would we be but for the grace of God? Our Jewish people who are finally going to have their eyes open and see who this is. And, and I'm talking about the one we haven't mentioned yet, but it's coming right up in this verse. By the grace of God, yes. through the power of the Ruch HaKodesh, it will be revealed to them. What is it? The spirit of grace and of supplication. Remember supplication, they are crying out to their God. They're crying out for deliverance. We saw this back in uh, Egypt, and God raised up Moshe. We've seen it in Daniel, and God brings back their captivity, and they go back to the land. We're going to see it in a huge way right in Jerusalem in the future when this verse is fulfilled completely. In that Spirit's revelation, we have the rest of our verse. So that they will look on me. Now remember, God's still the one speaking. Jehovah. They're going to look on me, whom they have pierced. How do you pierce God? Does God have flesh and blood to be pierced? Does he look like us? Is he one of us? How can he say that he was pierced? Well, when you remember our triune God is an equal God. Jehovah and the Son, even though we see them personified in two different ways, are interchangeable. They're one and the same. We see the, the description in Revelation 1 of the Father, and then we see the description of the Son. And then I take you back into Daniel's description a little earlier in chapter 9, and I'll ask you which one's which. And I'll tell you, if you can figure it out, my hat's off to you. Because about the time you'll say, oh, we're talking about Jehovah, then you're going to say, no, now we're talking about the Son. Why? Because the names are interchangeable. Because they are interchangeable. Because they are one. Even though we see them separate to understand, they are still one. So, how was God pierced? He was pierced when he took on human form. He was pierced when God slipped into time and space, put on a face, and would call him Yeshua Jesus. That's how he was pierced. How did they pierce God? When the nail prints went into the, the nails went into his hands and into his feet. When the spear went into his side, he was pierced for our salvation. He was pierced specifically and originally speaking to the house of Israel, but we know that he made it available to all mankind, Jew and Gentile alike. That as we keep it in the context, remember our beloved Jewish brethren, those who had the veil of blindness, were looking for a reigning Messiah. They are looking for that one who's going to break the bondage that they're under. In Daniel's time, it was Medo-Persia. Start of Babylon, now it's Medo-Persia. In Yeshua's time, it was Rome. We're going to see, finally, when it happens, it's going to happen through, through the breaking of the power of the revived Roman Empire. We'll talk about that more as we go on to it. But what we have happening is we're relating it to our Jewish people, and they were looking for that ruling, reigning Messiah. They were looking for King Messiah. They were looking for the one who would rescue them, who would be another Moshe, because God even said, there's going to be one like Moshe who comes, and when he comes, hear him, listen to him. 
Well, there's one who came like Moshe. And if you compare Moshe and Yeshua, you will see so many comparisons. I, I brought out over 30 in one class before, and I hadn't exhausted the list. But he was a greater than. He was a greater than Moshe in every way. Moshe was over the house. Yeshua was the creator of the house. It goes on and on. Moshe was a great priest. This was the greatest high priest. Moshe taught them the sacrificial system. Here's the one who is the sacrifice. It goes on and on. So this is the one that they should have known and understood from their own prophets. They should have known that he was also the suffering servant of Isaiah 53, Yeshua 53, where it would tell that he was going to come and deal with this sin issue, shed his blood for the forgiveness of sin, then return in his second coming in that role as reigning king Messiah. He will do that. But what are they suddenly aware of? They see the piercings that happened in his first coming, that happened when he suffered, bled, and died. And suddenly they're realizing when they look on, on me, on God, whom they have pierced, they will mourn for him as one mourns for an only son. Do you remember the title, Son of David, Son of David? The Son, the only begotten Son of the Father. Now, this doesn't mean that he gave birth. This is talking about the ranking and position that he was headship over all, that he is the first. And in that ranking, he was able in his human flesh to provide salvation for all of us. In this, as they look on the one who, who they're mourning for now, as if he was the only Son. And in essence, he is because he is the only begotten Son of the Father. And they will weep bitterly over him because they realize they, they missed him. He's the firstborn. He was the first fruit of resurrection. He's the first that brings all of this salvation to us. And they missed it. And they're going to cry and mourn and they would welcome him now. And remember the scripture that says, Baruch haba Hashem Adonai, Blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. Yeshua said, when they're crying out to me in that way, that's when I'll come. Now as they're seeing, as their eyes are being opened by all the tribulation that they're suffering and what is going on, and they realize and they recognize this is their Messiah who will do what? Go right back to Daniel. Make reconciliation for iniquity. Make atonement. Atonement is to make you at one with God. That's how we break down the word in our English, that in essence it is saying that what has separated you from your God, this one has taken that away. Through his shed blood, you now have that relationship with the Father. And it's only through the shed blood of this one who is their Messiah and their Savior. And that's why he wears all of those titles and more. Following in the thought, chapter 13 and verse 1, and remember when it was originally written, there were not chapters and verses, it was a continual flow, and it says, when that day comes, a fountain or a spring will be opened up for the house of David, we're talking about the same people, for the inhabitants of Jerusalem, for sin and for impurity, or literally to cleanse them from sin and impurity. That's what we're being told here. That's what Daniel is referring to. So as we take that walk through Zechariah, and then we come into Romans, we're talking again about the same time that God has never forsaken the Jewish people. He has never said, I am done with you. He has never said, it is over. You cannot uh, have what I promised you unconditionally. God says, on the contrary, I am faithful. I am fulfilling my covenant. I'm going to call you my people, and I'm going to be your God. And they will finally be in that right relationship with this one who has done it all for them, who made reconciliation for their iniquity. This one that we are referring to now in Romans chapter 11, verse 25 and 26, where Shaul Paul says, I don't want you, brethren, you who are fellow believers with me, to be uninformed of this mystery so that you wise in your own estimation a Partial hardening has happened to Israel until the fullness of the Gentiles comes in. And so, or and then, all Israel will be saved, just as is written, the deliverer will come from Zion. He will remove ungodliness. He will re make reconciliation. He will remove iniquity from Yaakov, the name for Israel, 
This is my covenant with them when I take away their sins. This is the tie-in of what's being referred to and what's being promised to Daniel and why I say the near fulfillment was the release from captivity, the fact they were going to be able to go back to the land, but the greater and complete fulfillment is yet to be seen when Messiah returns in that glory, showing the piercings that show he was here the first time as the suffering servant to take away the iniquity of sin via his shed blood. That done, that blood on the mercy seat in heaven, now he is coming back to break the bondage of all who have come against his people, to set Israel up as the head of the nation. That's why it says the times of the Gentiles is filled. The time of their ruling is filled. Now it will be a Jewish nation that will be raised its head, and the rest of the world will come into her for their blessing also. Not left out, not kicked out, not forgotten, not second class, but in that order he will fulfill all these words that he's given to Daniel, Hezekiel, Zechariah, Isaiah, Jeremiah, Yohanan, John, Shaol, Paul. All will see this fulfillment. What a prophecy we have. And we have just barely begun. Mm -hmm. <laughs> I go to our next phrase because, again, we're going to see more of this as we continue on. He is going to bring in everlasting righteousness. What is everlasting righteousness? Well, it's an inward moral transformation of the people. The people are not going to be now full of a heart of sin. They're going to have a different heart about them. Let me explain to you how everlasting righteousness can be by taking you back to our prophets. And remember, Daniel was steeped well in his pro prophets. He knew what his prophets said. He knew Jeremiah's scroll. He knew well enough to know what to bring up to God and when to bring it up to God. He didn't bring it up to God at year 40 or year 50. He didn't even bring it up at year 60. He waited till it was very close to year 70 because that's what Jeremiah had said. Well, Jeremiah, Jeremiah also said something else very important, and that's Jeremiah 31, and that's what he's referring to Daniel about, because remember, the same one who gave Jeremiah, Jeremiah his prophecies and his visions is the very same one who's given this to Daniel. It's not only that God brings Gabriel to explain and give him understanding and insight, but God had given him the dream, too. He didn't eat something the night before, folks. <laughs> Remember, he's even fasting. <laughs> this was God-given. God gave him the, the vision, and then God's giving him the understanding. And I say, hallelujah, because we benefit from that, too. In Jeremiah, in Jeremiah, the prophet that he's very familiar with, we're going to chapter 31, and we're going to start with verse 33. 27 tells us, on our way to 33, Behold, days are coming, declares the Lord, when I will sow the house of Israel and the house of Judah with the seed of man, with the seed of the beast. Okay? We've got a battle going on in the land of Israel. We know that and we see that. In, but we see that there's going to be victory because uh, verse 29 is saying, In those days they will not say again, The fathers have eaten sour grapes and the children are suffering the consequences. Their teeth are set on edge. But everyone's going to die for his own iniquity. And it goes on in that understanding of, of the picture that he's given. In verse 31, Behold, days are coming, declares the Lord, when I will make a new covenant with the house of Israel and with the house of Judah. Okay, Israel and, and Judah was the ten northern and the two southern. They will be brought back together as one, but that's why it's referred to as separately there. And he's saying there's a day coming when I'm going to make a new covenant, not the covenant that I made with their fathers, who are the fathers? Abraham, Yitzhak, Yaakov, go down through Moshe and on down through the line. It's speaking specifically of the time with Moshe because it says that, that I took them by the hand to bring them out of the land of Egypt. We know that's, that's Moshe's day. But that covenant, they broke it. Even though I was a husband to them, I was faithful to them, God said. But they broke it. But it doesn't end there. God didn't say period, done, and over. Remember, he's unconditional in his covenant with them. He said, I will. And when God says, I will, take it to the bank. He will. Absolutely will. Even if there is a delay, he will. And he will in his perfect timing. God is seldom early, never late, always on time. So this is the covenant 
which I make with which I will make with them in the house of Israel after those days, declares the Lord. I will put my law within them. On their heart I will write it. I will be their God, and they shall be my people. They will not teach again each man his neighbor and each man his brother, saying, Know the Lord, for they will know me. In other words, they're not going to have to be told. Now they're going to know. From the least of them to the, the greatest of them, declares the Lord, for I will forgive their iniquity. Does that sound like Daniel's prophecy? And their sin I will remember no more. That's what he's talking about. This covenant that he is making with them is a new covenant. And that's what is called a new covenant. Remember verse 33 said that, that I will, I'm backing up, um, uh, okay, I think it says new in there. I'm not finding it fast, but he, we know it's, it's a, a new covenant that he is making because the old one, they broke. This one, he's going to not do it on stone like he did with Moshe and it was written on stone and this is what they broke. He's going to make it on their heart, write it on their heart. Heart. He's going to give them a soft heart, not a stony heart, a soft heart, the heart of flesh. He's going to put it in them and make that covenant with them. And that's when they will understand He is their God. He is the Messiah. He is their Savior. Their sin will be atoned for. There will be an end to it. There will be the finish of the transgression. All of this will happen. And lest anyone think and not understand that this is for Israel, and this will happen no matter what. If they want to put any break in there for any reason at any time, God says in verse 35, Thus says the Lord, who gives the sun for light by day. Anybody hot today? There's a sun out there. <laughs> and the fixed order of the moon and the stars for the light by night. I saw a full moon this weekend. Yeah. If you're where you can see it, you see stars out at nights, do you not? Who stirs up the sea so that its waves roar? been to the ocean recently? I saw it flood over Newport Beach over its borders. <laughs> the Lord of hosts. In our Hebrew, that's Adonai Sabaot. That's the Lord of the heavens. That's the Lord of all the angelic beings. That's the Lord of all the that we see in the heavens and what we don't see and what we don't know. The Lord over all of that says, if this fixed order departs from me, if the sun, if the moon, if the stars depart from me, okay, then the offspring of Israel will also cease from being a nation before me. And if that's not strong enough, he added on one more word. Forever! Now, when did forever end? <laughs> when does forever end? Is there an end to forever? And the answer is never. I know you all know that. It goes on forever because God declared it. And he said, there will always be a nation before me. So, Daniel, yes, you're in captivity. Yes, your numbers have come down slim. Yes, you are out of the land that I promised you because of disobedience, because I had to punish the iniquity, because I had to take my child out to the woodshed and child train that child so that they will come back in and be in line with me, see me as our God, be obedient, follow my commandments so that I can bless them. I have so much blessing I want to give out, but in another place God says that you could open up the storehouses of heaven and pour out such a blessing, see if you could contain it. That's what he wants to do. That's what he has promised. Bring in everlasting righteousness. Bring in what is forever. Sin will be done away with. It will not be repeated. I love the fact that God seals it up and lets us know history will not repeat itself. It will be done, it will be over, and it will be forever. And forever means forever. That beginning to that, we will see the ruling of Israel, the return of her to her God, the writing it on her hearts. We will see at the start of the millennial kingdom as a kingdom of righteousness, is perpetual righteousness that we will see in view there. But we do know that it won't be fully until even after that, till Satan is loosed, takes those who really have a heart for him to follow him, to come up in the face of God, and he is done away with at that time forever. <laughs> Just as it goes on forever, that, that there will be an Israel forever, Satan will be in the lake of fire forever. Amen. Hallelujah. Amen. 
declare it, step on it. We will crush his head under our feet the same way Messiah crushed the head of Satan in the crucifixion. What Satan thought was his day of victory was his day of defeat. He may have crushed the heel where the human touched the earth, but the human who touched the earth in the divine power of the God crushed his head, and it will be forever. Hallelujah. Yes. Don't you love Daniel's yes. prophecy? Doesn't it touch us today? And we're not done. We're still in verse 24. We're to the next <laughs> phrase. And we're going to hear these things again, too. Even after we get out of verse 24, excuse me. The next phrase is to seal up vision and prophecy. That's to vindicate the truth of the vision, establish the authenticity of all the prophets. That ratifies it. What's that saying? That all the people saying, who are saying, well, Isaiah said that 700 B.C. Jeremiah said that 600 B.C. Daniel said it 500 B.C. I think they're antiquated. I think it's too old. I think it's been forgotten. If it was going to happen, it would have happened. It's done. It's over. There's a change. No. This is God's putting his period on his prophet's words. This is his showing that it will be completed. It will be finished. The scrolls will be fulfilled. And now there will be unbroken communion with the Lord. So they won't need to be going and pulling out these scrolls and reading these scrolls. They'll be living in the presence of their holy God. Hallelujah again. When it says seal, we need to understand what it meant to seal up vision and prophecy as it's being said here in that time. Seal is, is speaking of a custom where they would affix a seal to a document and that was to guarantee its genuineness. I'm going to take you to a very interesting scripture. I almost got to teach on this last week and we didn't have time, but I'll give you a hint. Unless God changes my mind, tune in on Shabbat Friday night, Saturday, no, yeah, Friday night or Saturday morning or go to YouTube in a, about a week and see a whole lesson on Jeremiah, Jeremiah chapter 32. We're going to go back there again. If you're still in Jeremiah 31, you're just going to flip the page. We're going to look at Jeremiah 32. And we're going to look at verses 10 and 11, and then verse 44. We're not going to look at the whole chapter because that will take me a whole another class time. But let me just give you a highlight out of it, okay? Now, um, verse 9 tells you that Jeremiah, your man, bought a field. He weighed out silver for it. And in verse 10, I signed and sealed the deed, called in witnesses, weighed out the silver on the scales. Then I took the deeds of purchase, both the sealed copy containing the terms and conditions and the open copy. So we're reading traditionally what they did in, in Yermia's day, and we still do it today. If you purchase a house, you have a grant deed. You sign on that grant deed that it belongs to you. It's signed by witnesses who attest to you or who you are, and this is your land. It gets the government seal on it or the, the state seal, whatever seal it needs on it. And it's binding. It's binding in a court of law. So your man bought some property, and he signed the seal, or signed sealed the deal by signing it. Roger, can you get the door? He and uh, uh, he called in witnesses, so everything is authentic. He paid the price for it. Verse forty-four tells us. I've got to scroll down real quick. Verse forty-four. My little screen makes it small. Men will buy fields for many. Sign and seal deals, deeds, sorry, sign and seal deeds, and call them witnesses in the land of Benjamin, in the cities of Judah, in the cities of the hill country, in the cities of the lowland, in the cities of the Negev, for I will restore their fortunes, declares the Lord. Okay, did you hear where? You heard Benjamin, Judah, the Negev. You heard several different places. If you know Israel's history, you know that the land was divided among the 12 tribes that each had their section, and this is talking about different sections. And God's saying there's going to be land that the Jewish people are going to be buying, they're going to be selling, they're going to be making their deals. You're, me, you're going to be an example. Now here's why I get such a, a kick out of this, what I love. Yermia is known as the weeping prophet. He's known as doom and gloom. I'm sorry, but that's all he could deliver. Why? Because people were not waking up. They were not paying attention. They were not returning to their God. And so he was telling them, here is your fate. 
you are going to be caught in taken and taken into captivity by the Babylonians. Your faith is being sealed by your very actions because you are not being obedient to God and he has to fulfill what he warned you, that if you did not, there would be consequences to pay. Well, how popular do you think that was? Popular enough to get him thrown into the well, to get him thrown into prison, to get him thrown into the dungeon. And in that, does he get mad and say, well, you guys are just going to get what you deserve? No. He's known as the weeping prophet. He's crying. He's heartbroken. And he still keeps trying to bring the message to his people that they're not right with their God, that they've got to get right with their God, that if they would get right with their God, there would be this uh, change, but because you're not going to. And how could he say that? Because God knows the future. God isn't figuring it out as it goes on. He already knows. He knows what's going to happen a year from now. How many of you foretold pandemic for 2020? How many of you on January 1 who make your little, um, what do you call them? Resolutions. resolutions. Mm -hmm. How many of you made resolutions with the pandemic in mind? <laughs> None of us could see this coming. But did God get surprised? No. no. He knew and he already had a plan to work and bring his people through it. It's not caught him off guard. I love the way one of our class members says, he's not up in front of his throne pacing. He is seated on his throne. He is in control. We cannot see and understand it. This is where we walk it by faith and where we trust. And he was speaking through your man, telling the people, you are going to go into captivity. I'm sorry. You brought on yourself. The consequences are here. You're not turning back. It's happening. It's going to happen. But, and I love God's butts. <laughs> I'm going to bring you back into the land. There's a future for you and a hope. Do you remember Jeremiah chapter 29 and verse 11? For I know the future and the hope that I have for you. And he's talking to the people of Israel that he's got a future for them. Not one of despair. Not one that they're written off. No. Yes, they're going to suffer punishment. Yes, there's going to be consequences. But you're going to come back into the land. And I believe that prophecy again had a near and a far fulfillment. They did come back into the land. We know that. We even see Israel back in the land today because she went out again for the same reason, disobedience to her God. Yet in 1948, she was a nation born again in a day, as Isaiah 66 said she would be, back in the land. Ezekiel 37 that we read from earlier is talking about Israel back in the land, but she's those dry bones. Her spirit isn't in her yet because she still isn't turning to her God and crying out as she will from what we read in Zechariah, that God was working through Jeremiah to set, tell his people, it's not over forever, it's not done, forgotten, all your promises are, are in the, the trash now. No, God said, I will bring you back. You will be my people. I will be your God. I will fulfill what I said. And hear me, I'm going to use you for proof. So, he's in prison. His relative comes to him in prison. They know the, the Chaldeans are right there. They know captivity is, is imminent. And this relative says, um, I've got a piece of land. I want you to buy it, Uncle Jeremiah. Um, I can't hold on to it. I need the money. Maybe they needed it for food. Who knows what? Could have had a good reason. But he goes to his uncle in, in prison and says, buy my land for me. You're my kinsman redeemer. That means that he could buy it back the land, keep it in the family, because he was a near relative. And your man had the funds to do it. He's in prison, but he had the money to do it. And he makes the deal in prison. And they write out the deed, and they sign it. He pays 17 pieces of shekel, silver, we just read that, and the land is his. Now, right after that happened, your man even himself thinks, what did I just do? <laughs> Now, was it buyer's remorse? No. <laughs> the land was good land. It wasn't buyer's remorse, but it was, God, I'm confused. You told me my nephew was going to come. He was going to ask me to buy the land. I was to buy the land. I'm to purchase it. I've done it all, but, but I'm going off into captivity. What good is this going to do me? And you had me seal it and put it in clay pots where it would last, those deeds would last for a long time. How long do they last? Just ask anybody who's looked at the Dead Sea Scrolls. 
written thousands of years before, and we can still read them today. They last in those clay pots. That was the perfect way to keep it. And God was saying, no, I want to encourage my people. You will come back into the land. You'll have deeds to this land again. You will buy and sell in this land. This land will belong to you. This land I gave to Israel forever. That's what he's saying. At a time of despair. How does that touch us today? We're in the midst of a pandemic. We don't know what the future holds. They're threatening us that, that what you can't see is, is trying to kill you. That this virus is airborne. you got to protect yourself. you got to put on masks. you got to glove your hands. You've got to take all these steps for sanitation. And yet people are still getting hit with it. They don't know what their future holds. But if they know their God, they know who holds their future. Amen. And I give that to all of us to encourage us today. Don't get despair. Don't get discouragement. Don't buy into anything Satan is selling you. That's not what you want to buy. Get into the Word of God and hold on to His promises. Did He say, I'll bring you halfway through a pandemic? <laughs> Did He say, I'll start you into the river and then I'm going to leave you in the middle of the river? You better have good arms and good legs, <laughs> good lungs, and if those lungs have COVID in them, it's all over. <laughs> no. He said, I will see you through. I won't let the waters overflow you. I won't let the fire scorch you. I will see you through. You're a man. Your people will come back to this land. Danielle, yes, you're going to return in the 70 years like I promised, but I'm going to give you a prophecy that's going to touch all the way through to where we are today. Israel, are you discouraged? You are in a land finally there, but are you on top of it? Are you comfortable? Are you safe? Or are you seeing anti-Semitism rise around the world? I take you no further than last weekend's um, news highlights. So many anti-Semitic attacks around the world that it made my head spin. And I don't have my head in the sand like an ostrich where I don't see and know what's going on. This is something I stay on top of, but it took a surge up last week. It happened in several different locations. It happened for no reason except they were Jewish. That God is promising our people, you are in rebellion, you are suffering consequences for not being obedient, but I will bring you back into your land, and I will be your God to you in that land. You're back in the land, but I'm not your God yet because you're not letting me be. I am your God, but you're not in relation. And yet I'm going to allow a time of trial, a time of tribulation, a worldwide pandemic on steroids, people, in many different ways. It's given out in seals and in trumpets and in bowls of wrath that is poured out. And what will be the end result? Will Israel be done, gone, over? You know, she just happened to be born in a bad neighborhood. She's got 22 mm -hmm. Arab neighbors around her that any one of them would love to swallow her up. And she is so big and so strong, she doesn't have to worry about that, right? Fourteen Israels can fit in the state of California. She's smaller than the state of New Jersey. Now, look at the hair gland around her. She's got every reason, worldly, to look and panic. But God put her there, and God is her defense. And just as little David went up against giant Goliath, she will see her enemies come down. Because she will see her Messiah return and slay the enemies who have come against that land. All of them have converged. All of them have come together. It's what we call the Battle of Armageddon. And this is what God was, was encouraging your man. It's not even over then when you see all the enemies come up against her from the north, from the south, from the east, and from the west. When they all converge there, yes, there's going to be a huge battle and the blood is going to flow from the north to the south as high as a horse's bridles. The slaughter will be horrendous. The people who come through will be small in number, but God will have his remnant come through. And when they come through, it's because he has returned, as that one that we read about in Zechariah 12, where they will see the nail, nail prints, they will know this is the one who was here before. He is our Messiah. He is our Savior. And they will welcome him into the land, and they will have the faith in their hearts and to believe as they should have all along. Yermia's deeds, they'll be good. Buy the land, Yermia. You didn't make a mistake. Show my people. There's hope. There's a future. There's a promise. 
and I, God, will fulfill it. Hallelujah. Daniel, you've given us a lot to think about here. That vision is sealed. It, it's got that seal on it that makes it authentic. Same way that your papers that are legal have those seals. They have to have the seal. This had to have the seal. I take you very, very quickly to Revelation chapter 8. We have a grant deed to the earth. It's got seals on it. The only one who's allowed to break open the seals is the owner. And remember, it belongs to the earth. And Yohanan's asked that question, who can open the seal? And he cries, there's nobody. God, we've looked through all the heavens. We've looked through the earth. We've looked under the earth. There's nobody. And God says, no, there's one. And Yohanan is shown. One who looks like a lamb who's been slain, but he's now the lion of the tribe of Judah, who is the king of, and I'm not going to say of the jungle, because he's king of kings. He's king of the Jews. He's king of all this world has to offer. He took the, the deed from the hand of the Father, from the hand of Jehovah, and he broke open the seals because he owned it. And we will see this promise is kept the same way Jeremiah will see this. The document set in order is a guarantee, it's genuine, and it's good all the way through. That's what Daniel's being told to seal it up, put the stamp on it. This will be authentic, this will be genuine, this is your guarantee, and prophecy. Um, it is, is what is being promised, the fulfillment of this prophecy, and to anoint the most holy place. Now again, if you go to other people, they can give you another answer for a most holy place. But if you go to the Jews, you go to Jerusalem being the holy city, what is the most holy place? The temple. That's what was holy to them. That was holy to them all the way back when it was the tabernacle. Because the tabernacle was the temple on, um, it can be moved. Can't be my word. The temple became the permanent. The tabernacle was what could be moved as they <coughs> moved. But the tabernacle was a precursor to the temple. When they had the temple, they didn't set the tabernacle up anymore. The temple, the tabernacle, this was where God dwelt with his people. That's why it was holy, because the holy God was dwelling with the people. They would see the Shekhinah glory in the smoke so that it did not blind them, but they would see it come on the most holy place of the tabernacle in the wilderness. They saw that Shekhinah glory cloud lift up and guide them through the wilderness. When they came to the temple and the temple was made, the Shekhinah glory was in the temple. We know that the temple is not there now. We know there will be a temple there during tribulation times, but we will not see it filled with the glory of the Lord until we get past Ezekiel 37, where we are right now, past Ezekiel 38 and 39, where we have the whole battle go on, the battle of Armageddon, and chapter 40, we have the new temple that will be filled with the glory of our Lord Messiah. Hallelujah. You want to read of the coming glory? Start with chapter 40 and read to the end of the book. It is exciting. Uh, Daniel here is being told there will be a holy of holies again. There will be a most holy place. That's indicating there's going to be a new temple. We've seen a temple in David's time. Well, sorry, let me take that back. David had it on his heart. But he didn't get to build it because he was a man of war. He had blood on his hands. Shlomo, his son, was the one who built it. So I've got to say the temple was Shlomo's time, Solomon's time. About before 800 B.C., 900 B.C. in that area. <clears throat> then we see the temple in Yeshua's day. Herod's temple is what it's known as at that time because Herod was the one in charge then. We know that was destroyed in 70 A.D. We know that, that the Lord prophesied it in Matthew 24 again, a near and a far fulfillment. He was letting his Talmudim know. They're looking at the glory of the temple. Look, Yeshua, isn't it gorgeous? And he's saying, the day is coming where there won't be one stone left on top of the other. 
And we know that came true in 70 AD, but we know it had a further reaching because there's another temple coming. There will be a third temple in the tribulation period of time. It is not the temple of Ezekiel chapter 40. You read it and you will see the difference all over the place. In fact, to even have room to build the temple that we see in Ezekiel chapter 40, you have to have the great earthquake that happens when the Lord returns, that cleaves the Mount of Olives in two, that opens up that valley north to south, east to west, to make a larger area because this temple has to be so big that all the nations of the world can come up to it and move through it so that they bring in their offerings to the Lord and the blessings will go back to their land. Am I making all this up? Has Rochelle spun a good story? <laughs> Let me just show you real quickly. Hezekiel, Ezekiel chapter 41. We're not going to look at it all. And I think I just felt I did. I just lost that one. So now we're going to have to go back and forth on one tablet. But forgive me, it'll just take a little bit longer. Because I'm not going to try to open that one up for the sixth time in class. <laughs> Ezekiel chapter 41. And we'll just read verses 1 through 4 right here, right now. Then he brought me to the nave and measured the side pillars. Six cubits wide on each side was the width of the side pillar. The width of the entrance was ten cubits. The sides of the entrance were five cubits on each side. and measured the length of the nave, forty cubits, and the width, twenty cubits. Verse 3, then he went inside and measured each side pillar of the doorway, two cubits, and the doorway, six cubits high, and the width of the doorway, seven cubits. He measured his length, 20 cubits, and the width, 20 cubits, before the name. And he said to me, this is the most holy place. Wow. What did I just run through? They just built the most holy place out of the tabernacle. The, remember the <coughs> building? was The whole building was a holy place, but the most holy was the, the second part of that building. They just built it with these measurements that are given. And these are bigger measurements than the ones that were given for the tabernacle that they were told how to build it back in the time of Moshe, back in the desert. And this is a new temple, and this temple is the temple that will have the most holy place. It will be filled with the Shekinah glory of our God. Hallelujah. Let me show you who's on that throne. Let me show you who fills this temple. Go with me to Zechariah, Zechariah chapter 12. And those of you who are around me in my ministry know that you hear a name also, and this name that we have for our ministry also called Samach comes right out of these verses. Zechariah, and I went to 12. Did I tell you 12? Pardon yeah. me. Go to chapter 6, verses 12 and 13. Sorry. <laughs> my tongue isn't working as fast as my brain, or my brain's slower, whatever. We want chapter 6 and verses 12 and 13. Okay? Uh, now we're talking, God is talking to Yahshua, the son of Jehazah, the high priest. So we're talking, the one, the high priest would be the one who would go into the, the most holy place. Once a year, day of atonement, to make the sacrifices. This, this is the head of all the priests, okay? And the Lord says, thus is the Lord of hosts, Adonai Sabaoth. He uses that name again. Behold, oh, do you remember that word in Revelation? Behold, Behold. <laughs> wake up, pay attention, don't miss this. Behold, a man. But this isn't just any man. This is a man whose name is Samach. And I say that for those of you who are around me who know our ministry called Samach. Samach means the branch. This man, whose name is a branch, because he will branch out from where he is, he will fill the temple of the Lord. Yes, it is he who will build the temple of the Lord. Samak, this one who's also called the man, this is showing his deity, fully God, fully man. This is the one. He's going to build the temple of the Lord, and then in verse 13, it repeats it. Yes, he's going to build the temple of the Lord, and he who will bear the honor and sit and rule on his throne. So he builds it, and he sits on the throne there. Thus he will be a priest on his throne, and the council of Shalom will be between the two offices. He's going to be a ruling king, and he's going to be a priest. Well, wait a minute. I thought the kings came from Judah, and the priests came from the Levites. Yes. But this is the one who is prophet, priest, and king. We see prophets and priests. We see priests and king. We don't see prophet priest and king, except in one, and his name is the branch. 
He is the one who will spring forth and fill the face of the earth. And if I took you to Isaiah 11, it would tell you that out of Jesse, a rod would spring forth. And that rod comes from a root that gives us a branch that springs out like out of a tree that had been hewn down. And we're talking about the son of Jesse, who is David, who has the son of David. We're talking about the line of Judah, but we're talking about the priestly line. We're talking about the one we call him, Yeshua Jesus, who is fully human, son of David, but he's fully God. And that's why in Psalm 110, David speaking says, the Lord said to my Lord, how can it be that way? How can he be son of David and Lord of David at the same time? Only because he is deity, fully God and fully man. This is who is being talked about. This is the one who will sit on the throne in the most holy place. And who built it? Solomon? Shlomo? No. Who built next? We'll just call it Herod's. Herod? Well, no. <laughs> Tribulation? No. The one who builds it is the Lord he himself. He will build it in the coming day for the millennial time when he will sit on the throne, rule and reign, priests and king. Hallelujah. That's who it's being talked about. So, i got to sum up. I need a swallow <laughs> water. <laughs> Are your uh, brains getting sloggy? <laughs> Is there a lot to wrap our brains around? If we could contain God, then he's only as good as our level. Yeah. He is awesome. He is amazing. His plans are phenomenal. They are literally out of this world. I dare you. Try to create. Just, just try to create. And then try to create an amount of, of variety and control and keep it all going. And know the thoughts of man. And know the plans of man. And know what man's going to do in your world. And what you're going to do because your plan will never be thwarted. I go on and on and on. But here, let's just bring it back in. Seven things God said that he will accomplish in this time frame. Remember, it's a 490 period year period of time. Finish the transgression. Make an end of sins. Number three, make reconciliation for iniquity. Number four, bring in everlasting righteousness. Number five, seal up the vision. Number six, seal up the prophecy. And number seven, anoint the most holy or the most holy place. Seven things will be accomplished on the All seven. When they are full and they are done and it is complete, we have our number seven, which just happens to stand for completion, perfection in Scripture. That is what he's being told. So as you're going back to Daniel, Daniel, Daniel chapter 9 and verse 24, now I know you're all saying, well, I get it. We can go home. We don't need 25 to 27. We understand them all, don't we? <laughs> but what did God tell Daniel that he was going to give him? And remember, I got all excited because I said, this is what we need. This is when we pray what we should be asking for also. I think it was verse uh, 23, was it? Yes. Uh, no, 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 no. Verse 22. Gabriel. An angel who's known by his name, that he's the hero, mighty angel of God, is what his name means. Power and strength, and we see that in him and his character in scripture. I have now come forth to give you insight with understanding. Yes, we're going to get insight, we're going to get understanding. Here's what the whole vision is, Daniel, I just give you the whole vision and all these seven things will be fulfilled in this 490 years of time. But I think you need a little bit of insight and a little bit of understanding. Because you should already be scratching your head and saying to me, well, she's backed herself into a corner now because she keeps saying 490 years. Mm -hmm. And if captivity was 500 B.C., that's before we even hit A.D. That's before we even had Yeshua come in his human form the first time. And it's certainly a long time before 2000 A.D. And some of this, all of this, isn't fulfilled yet, isn't completed yet. Some of it is, but not all of it. What is? Do we have a problem? NASA. <laughs> Verse 25 starts out and says, So you are to know and discern. Or you may have, um, so that you are to be given understanding. I, I'm looking... Uh, both of mine here say, therefore, 
know and discern, okay? Which discern's good, because discern is understanding and action. If you really understand, you discern it. And that's what, what he is being told now. You're going to know this, Danielle. You're going to understand it. You're going to discern it. And here we go. That from the issuing of the decree, from the going forth of this decree, whichever translation you have, that's what it means, to restore and rebuild Jerusalem. Until Messiah the Prince, there will be seven weeks and 62 weeks. Okay. Now, if I take you out of that 409 years and take you back into Daniel talk, Daniel talk, Jewish talk, that time, remember we've got 70 periods of sevens. So now, He's saying, I'm going to help you understand. We're going to break this down. We're going to give you the understanding you need that this started, and I love God's got a clock. When I get to heaven, there are no clocks. But here on this earth and in relation to mankind, tick-tock, God's clock. And if you want to watch God's clock and follow God's clock, watch it in relation to the nation of Israel because that's how it ticks is in relation to Israel. So Gabriel is telling uh, Daniel now, there's going to be a command that's going to go out. When that command goes out, tick-tock, God's clock. His clock, he's on the clock, and the job's going to be done in the amount of time I said. <clears throat> okay? That's great. We've got a starting point. We've got something to zero in on, something that we can hang our coat on, a peg in there. Let's see what that command is. From the issuing of a decree to restore and rebuild Jerusalem. Okay? Restore. Repeople Jerusalem. Rebuild the walls of Jerusalem. Because it's not just saying, I'm going to put people in there, that Jerusalem is going to be rebuilt. So there's going to be a return of people. There's going to be a building of the walls. <clears throat> and it's going to happen. Piece of cake. Poof, it's done. Not if you've read ahead of me. <laughs> it says that it will be done. It, <clears throat> there will be seven weeks and 62 weeks from that time. It will be built again with the plaza and the moat, even in times of distress. Uh oh, here we go again. Remember, Jeremiah finds himself in a well. He finds himself in prison just for giving out faithfully what the Word of God says. They don't like hearing it. It would be like if we succeeded, succeeded today to an enemy. Let's go back to 9-11, when, when America really felt the threat. And if a prophet spoke up at the end and said, that enemy is going to swallow you up, America. We would not have liked what we've said. We would have said, shut your mouth. We don't need a naysayer. We don't need someone who's doomed. And we put them away. Well, that's, in essence, what they did. They're going to have trouble in their rebuilding. It's not going to go easy. And so God warns them of that. This is how it's going to be. Don't let that throw you. When you know God's given you a word and you see everything come against it, don't let it throw you. If God promised it, God will do it. Donia, I'm promising you, they will repeople Jerusalem and they will rebuild it. It's going to be tough. It's not going to come easy, but it's going to happen. What do we read about in Ezra and Nehemiah? Nehemiah. What do we read? We read about the rebuilding. The rebuilding of Jerusalem, the returning of the people to go back. They don't go back in droves like they should. They go back in small numbers, so small number that it breaks Daniel's heart. He doesn't go back, I think, mainly because of age. He's in his 80s. I think he could make the trek back by that point. God had purpose for him still in the land where he was. But let's just take a quick sneak peek in the book of Nehemiah, okay? I'm going to give you, I can't get on this one, I'm going to have to go here. I'm going to take you through a number of scriptures in Nehemiah just to show you that it happened, as he said, in troublesome times, okay? Because we want to know this is authentic. We're going to look at the start of that decree also because that's critically important. But let me show you what happens when they went about to start to restore Jerusalem and repeople it and build again, the walls and uh, the city, okay? Nehemiah 4, verses 1 through 3. Now it came about that when Sanballat heard that they were rebuilding the wall, he became furious. He was, he was of the Arab descent, the Arab lines. I'm, I pause because I don't want you for a moment to think I'm Arab bashing. I'm just telling you where he came from. He was one of the enemies of the land of Israel. 
See, Israel was born in a bad neighborhood in the beginning. Remember, she had to root out seven nations out of that land. But God said, I'm giving that land to you. I'm taking them out because of their sin, because they, they are so evil. If they don't get this land, you do. So Israel, from the beginning, had her enemies. They are among those lines. They were called Philistines in the beginning. They are still, there are still those who use a slant off of that name called Palestine. Palestinians. Today, that's how they got their name, from the original enemy. Another story. Sandal was of the Arab line that was opposed to the Jewish people. He became furious, very angry, mocked the Jews, spoke in the presence of his brothers and the wealthy men of Samaria and said, what are those feeble Jews doing? Are they going to restore it for themselves? Can they offer sacrifices? Can they finish it in a day? Can they revive the stones from the dusty rubble, even the burned stones? It goes on. Do I want to read verse? No, I won't read verse 3 because I want to hurry. I want to keep moving on. But they do. Then in verse 3, even what they're building, if a fox should jump on it, he would break their stone wall down. He's saying, you can't do it. You can't accomplish this. And even if you get it built, it's going to be so weak and so feeble. And you've done such a lousy job that even if a little fox jumped on it, the wall would collapse. He's poking fun at them. He's giving them a hard time. He's irritating them. Does he stay that simple? No. He, they, take, they take up against them. They do even more. Verse 7 tells us that Balak, the Tobiah, the Arabs, the Ammonites, the Ashdodites, they heard the repairs of the walls of Jerusalem went on. That, that um, coming at them, that the words, what's that? Ah, the terrorizing verbally that they were doing, I can't think of the word I want, didn't stop them. The breaches began to be closed. They began to see Israel was actually doing it. The wall was actually being rebuilt. The mockery wasn't stopping them. That's the word I wanted. So all of them became really angry now. Our words didn't scare them off. We couldn't go boom and get them to run. Now we've got to do something more. So they conspired together. We're going to come and we're going to fight against Jerusalem. We're going to cause a disturbance in it. We're not going to, going to let this go down. We're going to get even worse. It, it's kind of like they threatened, and now they're going to put teeth behind the threat. Verse 12, when the Jews who lived near them came and told us ten times, they will come up against us from every place where you may turn. Then I stationed men at the lowest parts of the space behind the wall, the exposed places. I stationed people in families with their swords, their spears, and their bows. When I saw their fear, I rose up and spoke to the nobles, the officials, and the rest of the people. And this is Nehemiah speaking, by the way. Do not be afraid of them. Remember, the Lord who is great and awesome. And fight for your brothers. Fight for your sons. Fight for your daughters. Fight for your wives. Fight for your houses. Nehemiah was wise. He saw where there were areas that they had not been able to close up yet. He knew that's where the enemy was going to come in. The enemy's going to look for that weak point where they can get in, and they're going to attack there. And he took the men who could defend those areas. He put them on duty there, but he didn't put them there alone. He said, take your family with you. Take your little wife that you love. Take your little children. They're going to be right there with you. Now, will a man fight for his, for his land in this country? Yes. And I thank every veteran within hearing my voice for fighting for my freedom in the United States of America. Yes, but... Will you fight all the harder if the danger is literally at your front door and you think it's going to hurt your wife and your children? You're going to come out like a bear and you're really going to fight. And Nehemiah knew they're going to get discouraged by those naysaying voices, those men mockery, and you, know, you can't do it. Ha ha, look at the job you're doing. And then when that isn't enough to defeat them, then they're going to come at them with weapons of war. That if your little children are right between your legs while you're working, you're watching your little one scurry around and play, and you see someone who's going to come and try to hurt your little one, oh no, you're going to bring up your sword and you are going to fight and you're going to root that enemy out. And that's what they needed, was that kind of encouragement. And so Nehemiah was wise, and they do fight. And if we go all the way now to chapter 6, we're not going to read verses 1 to 16, but read it on your own later. In chapter 6, we see Sanbal is still coming at them. It was reported to Sanbal, Tobia, to Gesham, the heir, to the rest of the enemies, that I had rebuilt the wall and that no breach remained in it, although at that time I had not set up the doors and the gates. So the wall's been built, but there's still open gates. The doors aren't in the gates to close 
the gates off yet. So then they know, okay, we got to go after those gates. And if you keep reading down, you'll see that they come to fight again and again and again. Where do I want to come back in? Um, the end of verse 9, but now, oh God, strengthen my hands. The, just before it says, they will be discouraged with the work. It will not be done. Don't, but now, oh God, strengthen my hands. Don't let them become discouraged. Don't let that happen. And we get all the way down to verse, uh, let's go to 15. So the wall was completed. Was it in trouble sometimes? Yes. But did they battle it? Did they win? Yes. The wall was completed on the 25th of the month of Lul in 52 days. It took them almost two months. They battled it, but they won. Verse 16, when all our enemies heard it and all the nations surrounding us saw it, they lost their confidence, for they recognized that this work had been accomplished with the help of our God. Hallelujah. If you're building a wall and it's trouble sometimes and you see improvement and you see you're getting there and your gates are still open, put up the defenses. Keep going. God is on your side. God will see you through. God is faithful. He kept his word to the Jewish people and we see in the book of Nehemiah that it does get finished. But i got to back you up now. And I see because of our time I'm going to be leaving this on a cliffhanger, but that's great. That way I know you'll want to come back for class next week. We're going to go back to Daniel, Daniel 9, and we've got to look at one other thing that's very important here for our understanding. Okay? We're told in verse 25, were we? I think we were in verse 25. Here we go. Okay. We're told that there, there's going to be this decree to restore and rebuild at um, Jerusalem until Messiah the Prince will be seven weeks and 62 weeks. It'll be built. What's all will be built and it'll be a time of distress. Okay? Now, he made it very clear and very specific. And this is what we need to look at. And I just read it and kind of read past it. The decree that th that's marking the time is to restore and to rebuild Yerushalayim. Okay? Now, if I take you back, and I should tell you to keep a finger there, go back to Ezra 6, and we're going to look and see that there was a decree given, okay? But the decree was given only for the rebuilding of the temple, not for the rebuilding of the city, okay? Let's go back. I think we need to see that. I'd rather me hurry through this. I'm going to get it in the detail because timing is going to be of utmost importance for this prophecy. And remember, we need understanding. We need insight and understanding. So we're going to go back. This time we're going to look from the book of Ezra. We were in Nehemiah. Now we're going to look from Ezra. Remember, both of these books talk about the rebuilding. Whoops. Ezra. Ah. Okay. Ezra 6. There we go. I've got my 6 in there. Okay. And we're going to see the decree in, in verse 3. In the first year of King Cyrus, Cyrus is Medo-Persia, in the first year of King Cyrus, Cyrus the king issued a decree concerning the house of God at Yerushalayim. Let the temple, the place where the sacrifices are offered, be rebuilt, and let its foundations be retained. Its height be 60 cubits, and its width 60 cubits. Okay, so we have a specific decree. We have a decree going out that is for the rebuilding of this temple. Okay, concerning the house of God and the temple, the place where the sacrifices are rebuilt. Okay, now, go down to verse 14. You see, Nehemiah gives us the end when the walls were rebuilt. I'm taking us back earlier uh, because this came first. Verse 14, And the elders of the Jews were successful in building but through the prophesying of Haggai the prophet and Zechariah the son of Edo, and they finished building according to the command of God of Israel and the decree of Cyrus, Darius, and Artaxerxes, king of Persia. This temple was completed on the third day of the month of dark. It was the sixth year of the reign of King Darius. Okay? But remember what we read? We read that there's a decree to go out to rebuild Jerusalem. And what did it say in Daniel? Um, I've lost it. <laughs> rebuild Jerusalem and... Ah, the, the, the temple and the city. Oh, the yeah. people would be restored in the city, the, to rebuild, to restore the city. Okay? So it wasn't just a decree about the temple. Well, the first decree that we get was the temple only. It's not the rebuilding, the restoring of Jerusalem. It's just the temple. It was the first time the decree went out. It went out from Cyrus. 
We just read it here in chapter 6, but let's go back in Ezra to chapter 1. Okay? <clears throat> because we want to be exact. We want to know if we're going to mark our time, at the 490 years, we're going to mark it by what Daniel tells us. We have to mark the start of that time when the decree went back to restore Jerusalem and to repeople it. Okay? Rebuild. You know, it's not just the temple. Ezra 1, the first year of Cyrus, king of Persia, the same thing we read in chapter 6, in order to fulfill the word of the Lord by the mouth of Jeremiah, Jeremiah declared it, the Lord stirred up the spirit of Cyrus, king of Persia, so that he sent a proclamation throughout all his kingdom. He also put it in writing, saying, Thus says Cyrus, king of Persia, The Lord, the God of heaven, has given me all the kingdoms of the earth. Cyrus is sitting on the high hill. Okay? And he's appointed me to build him a house in Jewish Lion, which is in Judah. Whoever there is among you of all his people, may his God be with him. Cyrus is putting this out in Persia. He's putting this out to the Jewish people. God's put on my heart for your, the temple to be built in Jerusalem. You Jewish people, that should be exciting to you. If you're feeling that, if you're wanting that, may God be with you. Let him go up to Jerusalem, which is in Judah, and rebuild the house of the Lord, the God of Israel. He is the God who is in Jerusalem. So want verse 4? Yeah, I want verse 4. Every survivor, whatever place he may live, let the men of that place support him with silver and gold, goods and cattle, together with a free will offering for the house of God, which is in Jerusalem. So, you Jews who want to go back and rebuild it, go. You who are around, support it. Give to it. Help it. Give your silver. Give your gold. Let it be rebuilt. Take the wealth out of this country and take it to Jerusalem and rebuild the temple. That's great. That's exciting. That's wonderful. We see um, this rebuilding of the temple, according to history, was 538 BC. Let me show you a couple other places I want you to, to always see scripture back up scripture. Second Chronicles chapter 36. Second Chronicles. Which, by the way, while I'm getting there, I love the fact that you know Cyrus was named 150 years before he was born. God called yeah. him out in prophecy and said that there would be this one named Cyrus who would do what we're reading that he's doing. And he said it about 150 years before Cyrus was born. And I just love, those of you going with me, you hear it, you see me. Mama's just giving birth. <laughs> She's looking at her beautiful little boy. She's counted, he's got 10 fingers and he's got 10 toes and he's healthy and he's crying out for his first food. And it's very important that we know the name and we record the name. Mama. What are you naming your baby? Hmm. I think I'll call him Cyrus. And it's established. God put in the heart. He told it, and then he fulfills it. I love it. Every detail. God dots every I. He crosses every T. He even names the kid 150 years ahead of time. Second Chronicles 36, 22. I threw that one in for free. I just love it. <laughs> 36, 22. 36, 22. In the first year of Cyrus, king of Persia. Are we talking about the same one? Are we talking about the same time? Is scripture backing up scripture? Yes. In order to fulfill the word of who? The word of the Lord. By the mouth of your man. Hmm, didn't we just read that? The Lord stirred up the spirit of Cyrus, king of Persia, so he sent a proclamation throughout his kingdom and also put it in writing, saying, Thus says Cyrus, king of Persia, The Lord of God of heaven has given me all the kingdoms of the earth, and he has appointed me to build him a house in Jerusalem, which is in Judah. Whoever there is among you of all his people, may the Lord his God be with him, and let him go up. Chronicles is now recording. Ezra has recorded. Let's take a run quick through prophet Isaiah, Yeshia. Isaiah chapter 44. What was the um, good verse on um, second chronicle? 36 um, verses 22 and 23. I read through 23. Isaiah 44, we're going to go to verse 28. Isaiah 44, 28. Come on, tablet. Come on. Whoop, whoop, I get impatient. I have a quote. It is I who says of, Sir, of Cyrus, he is my shepherd and he will perform all my desire. And he declares that Jerusalem, she will be built, and that the temple, your foundation, will be laid. Okay, we've looked at the building of the temple. 
he's fulfilling what God said he would do. So he's not only named ahead, but he's what he's going to do is told. And we see that in Isaiah 48, 4. And now going into chapter 45, remember, there wasn't a split in our scriptures, it is, but it was a continuous. So verse 1 says, Thus says the Lord to Cyrus, his anointed. He has put his anointing on Cyrus, whom I've taken by the right hand. He's leading him like, like you'd lead a little child to subdue nations before him. Remember, he's, he's head honcho here. And it's to loose the loins of kings, to open doors before him so that gates will not be shut. I, God, will go before you, make the rough places smooth. I will shatter the doors of bronze and cut their iron bars. I will give you the treasures of darkness and hidden wealth of secret places. God's blessing, Cyrus, so that you may know that it is I, the Lord God of Israel, who calls you by your name. Remember, he named Cyrus. For the sake of Yaakov, Jacob, my servant, and Israel, my chosen one, I've also called you by your name. I've given you a title of honor, though you haven't known me. He didn't even know God, and God put this on him and used him. Do we see that today? Can God use even the evil leaders? Yes. He uses them to do his purposes. It's not out of his control. It's just when there has to be something done, God says, this one will do it, and they do it. They think they're doing their own plan. God is the one who's orchestrated. So our first decree went out by Cyrus to rebuild the temple, but that's not what Daniel 9 said. Daniel 9 said, rebuilding Jerusalem, restoring it, repeopling it. There's a second decree that goes out. The second decree that goes out is by Darius, Darius, which I've already said, the great. And that's when, remember, it's Medo-Persia. This is when Persia's coming up stronger than Medo. Now, Darius follows Cyrus, okay? And I think we read this before. This was Ezra. Okay, so now we've seen it with Cyrus. The next one that comes up in place of Cyrus, who didn't dethrone him because they were on the same side. They were emerged, but one became more powerful. We have in Ezra 6. And you can read on your own verses 1 through 12 to get the whole story. We just need the first few verses. King Darius, then, I should start with the word, that's the key word, then King Dar Darius Darius issued a decree. Search was made in the car archives where the treasures were stored in Babylon. Remember, Medo-Persia swallowed up Babylon. In Ephetana, I don't know how to say it, in the fortress, which is in the province of Media, a scroll was found. There was written in it as follows. Memoranda. Remember, scrolls were sealed documents, they, these have authority. This memorandum says in verse 3, in the first year of King Cyrus, Cyrus the king issued a decree concerning the house of God at Jerusalem, let the temple, the place where sacrifices are offered, be rebuilt, and let its foundations be retained, its height being 60 cubits, and its width 60 cubits, with three layers of huge stones and one layer of timbers, and let the cost be paid from the royal treasury. Didn't we read about that? Wasn't it in Chronicles? That the people were to give, the, 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 the wealth came from Medo-Persia to go into Jerusalem to rebuild the temple. Just as been said, and here's the description, the size and everything. Verse 5, let the gold and silver utensils of the house of God, which Nebuchadnezzar took from the temple in Jerusalem and brought to Babylon, let them be returned and brought to the places in the temple in Jerusalem, and you shall put them in the house of God. So Nebuchadnezzar robbed the temple in Jerusalem, took the gold and silver utensils, put them in his own uh, place of wealth, his own, his own palace of, of wealth. And this one has come along since. We've had Nebuchadnezzar, we've had Cyrus, and we've had Darius. We're talking about Cyrus. He's the one who says, you know what? Those don't belong to us. They belong in the temple in Jerusalem. Take those treasures back. Take the gold. Take the silver. That was very generous. He could have poured it to himself, but had he, then God would have been heavy on him, mm -hmm. and God had anointed him for a purpose. Mm -hmm. He followed what God wanted and told him to do, and he did it. You keep reading, and you'll see the rebuilding. So we've got a first decree, and we've got a second decree. We've gone through Cyrus, and we've gone through Darius, but we still don't have what Daniel talked about. There's a third decree. This decree goes out by Artaxerxes. We need to go back to Ezra, and we're going to look at, oh, we're in Ezra. Okay, just go to Ezra chapter 7, next page, go to verse 11. 
7-Eleven. That's easy to remember. <laughs> Are you thirsty? <laughs> Ezra 7 and verse 11. Now, this is a copy of the decree which King Artaxerxes gave to Ezra the priest, so we know it's in Ezra's time, the scribe learned in the words of the commandments of the Lord and his statutes to Israel. Verse 12. Artaxerxes, king of kings, so he's the one that's up now, to Ezra the priest, the scribe of the law of the God of heaven, perfect peace. Shalom. And now I've issued a decree that any of the people of Israel and the priests and the Levites who are in my kingdom, in Artaxerxes' kingdom, who are willing to go to Jerusalem, may go with you, Ezra. You can take people with you. This is a generous chapter. He's saying, take your people and go back home. Okay? For as much as you were sent by the king and the seven counselors to inquire concerning you and your rich lion according to the law of your God, which is in your hand, and to bring the silver and gold, which the king and his counselors have freely offered to the God of Israel, whose dwelling is in Jerusalem. How far do I want to keep reading? Um, wow, do I want to keep reading? I'm running out of time. Okay. With all the silver and gold, I, I'm going to, you know, all with the money, they're to, to bring in the rams and the lambs for the offerings. What seems to good, good, what? I'm trying to hurry. Whatever seems good to you and to your brothers, do with the rest of the silver and gold. Take it, here's your money, do what you need to do, bring in the utensils, get your service for the house of God ready, deliver it in full before the God of your rich line. That's verse 19, verse 20. The rest of the needs for the, the house of your God for which you may have occasion to provide, provide for it from the royal treasury. So Artie's Worksheets has really gotten behind it, and it tells all the talents of silver and, and the wine and this and that, and everything that's being brought in. Um, I think we can drop down, um, tell him how to do it. Verse 25, you, Ezra, according to the wisdom of your God, which is in your hand, appoint magistrates, appoint judges, that they may judge all the people who are in the province beyond the river, and it goes on that, that uh, whoever doesn't observe the law of your God and the law of the king, judgment will be executed on him strictly, that whether for death or for banishment or for confiscation of goods or for imprisonment, whether he should be put in prison, his goods taken away, or whether he should be banished from the land or even he should suffer death, we're going to follow through and we're going to see that this is done. Okay? Now, I should have told you and I didn't give you years. The first decree by Cyrus was 538 B.C. to rebuild the temple. The second time the decree went by Darius to rebuild the temple was about 519 B.C., about 17 years after the first decree. It was a confirmation of the first, because remember Darius and Cyrus, they were together, Medo-Persia. The third decree by Artaxerxes now is in 458 B.C. That's some 50 years later, and it's for Ezra. Go up, put things to order for the temple. So even though the decree has gone out, we see it hasn't happened in its entirety yet. There's a fourth decree that's going to go out. This one is very interesting. This decree is by Artaxerxes, okay? How do we know that? Let's look at what the detail that Nehemiah gives, because Nehemiah gives us something Ezra didn't. So we're going now to Nehemiah chapter 2, and this is where I either leave, leave you on such a cliffhanger, it take me 15 minutes to build you back up next week, or I give it to you until you come back and see the rest. I'm going to hurry and give it to you, okay? Chapter 2, verses 1 through 8, I may not need to read it all, but let's start. It came in the month Nisan, the 20th year of King Artaxerxes. This is Nehemiah chapter 2. Okay, this is the fourth decree. The fourth decree that's gone out by Artaxerxes now. Not all four by him. Cyrus, Darius, Artaxerxes, and Artaxerxes again. Okay, verse 1 is telling us it's in the 20th year of his reign. Now, because of historians, we know the 20th year of Artaxerxes' reign. We know for a fact that was 445 B.C. So where I had to give you approximate dates before, I can nail this one. I can tell you Artaxerxes' 20th year was 445 B.C. And I can give you one more zinger. Let's keep reading. Okay? The wine was before him. I took up wine gave it to the king. Now, the king, now, I had not been sad in his presence. This is Nehemiah telling the story. So the king said to me, today on he sat, he's gone in the king's presence, he's kept there, he's bringing the king the cup to drink the wine. And he is so burdened, he is so bemoaning that it's showing on his face. He's sad, his countenance is sad. So the king said to me, why is your face sad, though you're not sick? 
this is nothing but sadness of heart. Well, Nehemiah, I was afraid. You know, I, I'm supposed to be pleasing the king. He shouldn't be seeing this, but it, it was eking out. He couldn't keep it hidden. And he said to the king, let the king live forever. He's showing his respect. Why should my face not be sad when the city, the place of my father's tombs, lies desolate? Its gates, they were consumed by fire. Well, the king said to me, what would you request? Then, uh, so I prayed to God of heaven. Smart move, Nehemiah. He didn't just shoot back an answer. He's given an opportunity. The king said, okay, I hear your problem. What do you want to do about it? Do I dare say God? What should I say? Do I ask? Do I not ask? Should I ask for it all? Should I ask for it? What do I? God, help. You know, God loves our split second prayers, too. That's right. <laughs> so, I said to the king, after he prayed, I said to the king, If it pleases the king, and if your servant has found favor before you, send me to Judah, to the city of my father's tombs, that I may rebuild it. And the king said to me, the queen sitting beside him, How long will your journey be, and when will you return? Do you catch it? In other words, I'm letting you go. I'm giving you that request. I just want to know how long you're going to be gone. So it pleased the king to send me, and I gave him a definite time. I said to the king, if it pleased the king, let letters be given me for the governors of the provinces beyond the river that may allow me to pass through until I come to Utah. Give me right of passage. The king's word was law in all the provinces. And he's saying, give me a paper that every stop point, they, oh, you're on king's business. Go. Doors are open. If you get me through... What? <laughs> we need that for COVID. Oh, we need that for COVID. <laughs> yeah. Let us get through safely. <laughs> but it would be faster if the king gave him this. And so the king did. The king is going to honor his request. The letter was sent to Asaph, the keeper of the king's forest, that he may give me timber to make the beams, the fortress, which is by the temple, the wall of the city, the house to which I will go on hurry. And the king granted them to me because the good hand of my God was on me. Notice he didn't say the king did it because the king's a good person. He said it because it's God in control. God was on the king. God got the king to say, go, and I'll take care of what you need. Okay? We can keep reading, but that sums it up right there. Now, Encyclopedia Britannica. Is that a good authority when it's talking about history? I don't I think so. I think we can trust it. We've got other encyclopedias to check it out. We've got historians through time. If they're going to go out on a limb and they're going to give a date, I think it's a trustworthy date. Now, I tell you this, and I'm making a big deal out of this because this is very critical for next week's study. Huh? you got to come back. <laughs> okay? There's a reason why we need to know the exact date. I already told you the year. But Encyclopedia Britannica goes so far out on the limb that it tells us the decree given by Artaxerxes was not just 445 B.C., but it was March 14, 445 B.C. Now, ask me how many specific dates we have in history in, re in reference to biblical happenings. And I'll tell you, very few. Slim I, right now, I can't even think of another one, but I'm sure there's at least another one. But when we're given something so specific, there's a reason for it. God knew we need this nail on this prophecy of Daniel's so that we understand and have insight for the rest of the vision when it's going to happen, as well as how, who, what, where, why, all the questions are going to be answered. This March 14, 445 B.C. said, Go and rebuild the walls. Restore Jerusalem. Ding, 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 ding. What did Daniel say? In closing, let's look at Daniel 9.25. And I really am closing. I know I'm past time. I love this. I'm so excited. I could go till midnight. Want to go? <laughs> I'm just getting going. It's over. <laughs> Daniel 9.25. Don't you love the Lord? Mm -hmm. Okay. I, I love his faithfulness. I love his detail. I love his in control. I love him. Verse 25. 
So you are to know and discern that from the issuing of the decree to restore and rebuild Jerusalem, ding, 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 <laughs> March 14, 445 B.C., from that point until Messiah the Prince, there will be seven weeks and 62 weeks. It will be built again with the plows and the mow. Everything's going to be built, even in times of distress. Well, we already looked at the times of distress. We won't have to go back and look at it, but we're going to pick up in verse 26 because we got a question. It's talking about the 62 weeks. We've been told about seven weeks. We've been told about 62 weeks. We've been told that they're in relation to Messiah, and we know when they start. They start March 14, 445 B.C. Now, here's your homework. <laughs> Get out your calculators. Get out your calendars. Get out your, all you mathematicians and start figuring. And I'll throw the monkey wrench into your works. <clears throat> you need a Jewish calendar. You need a Jewish mind. You need Jewish understanding. <laughs> my, my people here in my living room just gave up. They just threw in the towel. <laughs> Remember the mockery that discouraged them? Nah, 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 nah. <laughs> Well, you know what? God did it all for us, so no worries. But if you want to try to figure out ahead, go figure out, see where you come out, what time in history are you at, and what on earth, and I mean that, on earth, and I'll even get more specific, what happened in Jerusalem? Come back next week. That was Daniel 9. Daniel, we just ended with Daniel 9, 25, and we took a sneak peek at the first phrase of 26, which says, then after the 62 weeks, uh-oh, I'm giving the answer <laughs> to my homework. I'm not going to fill in the blank, but I can tell you, you should now know where to read to get your answer. You should be able to come back, and I should be able to give you all the gold crown, the star for the day, and A+, plus because God's given it to us that clearly. Knowing this part that clearly is going to help us for the understanding and the insight for the next part and the next part and the next part. Remember, we've got seven parts we're looking at. We're just beginning. Are you excited? Want to go to midnight instead of coming back next week? <laughs> Where's the sleeping bag? Where's the sleeping bag? Uh-oh. I don't have that many sleeping bags. I guess i got to let us go. So instead, we'll come back. Hmm. Let's see. July 8 plus 7. That will be July 15th on the Gentile Gwen calendar. <laughs> the specific is that is. We'll answer these questions July specifically. 15th. July 15th. If we're not up there around this throne getting our answers together, <laughs> then come back here and we'll keep working on our scripture. I hope it's been a blessing to you. I Forgive me for my silliness, but please understand, I'm excited. I love to share this. I love God's word. It's amazing. When was this prophecy written? Daniel lived in the, the late 500s BC. You know, we look at this timing of the temple to be rebuilt, 538, so it's before that. And it's so exact that the date 445 BC <clears throat> hits the nail on the head, and the dates we're going to talk about <clears throat> hit the nail on the head. Have you ever seen your God, if you know him like I do, as Savior and Lord in your life, have you ever seen him work in split-second timing? Amen. That's an awesome God. He's got right now over 7 million people on the face of this earth to move in all of that so that people come together at a certain time, so that back before... He could say to Hadassah, a little Jewish girl in that Persian Empire we're talking about, that I brought you into the kingdom for such a time as this. God is amazing. Anyone who doesn't believe in God, look around. Yeah. Open your eyes. Open your ears. God chose himself in time, and yet he's above time. He's orchestrating time. He set it in motion before the foundations of this world were laid out. Mm -hmm. And nothing stops God's plan. Mm -hmm. right. Now, 
Are you so worried about COVID today? <laughs> or whatever else. And I'm not making fun. For those who are stricken with it, our hearts are there. We prayed for them before we started this class. We'll pray for them again also. But please know, in the midst of whatever your trial is, your God is so precise that he can move a king. He can name a person. He can deal with a hostile situation. And it's putty in his hands you know, to perform what he has already said will be. If you can find any word that God has failed at, then I'll throw in the towel. I'll say my whole life has been spent in vain. And I'll concede. But I guarantee you, you can't find one word. Not one dot. Not one cross of the T in Hebrew, not one jot, and not one tail. Our God is faithful. Our God is awesome. Our God is, and are you ready for it? Roger, get off the, the muting. I want to hear everybody give my favorite word. <laughs> Our God <laughs> is, hold it, hold it. <laughs> Ineffable. <laughs> he is too big to be contained. He is too awesome. We cannot even see our God in one. We have to see him in three and yet understand he is one. He is the mighty God of Israel. He is the one true and living God. He is the one who planned our salvation and he is the one who saves us. He is the one who keeps us and he is the one who will deliver me to my home in eternity. When my feet leave this earth. Hallelujah. Mm -hmm. Let's close in prayer. <sighs> oh dear God. El El Yon Most High God. Adonai Yeshua Lord Jesus. Our Ruch HaKodesh Holy Spirit. Three in one triunity. Our blessed <coughs> God. You are amazing. Lord, my vocabulary is so poor. It just will not do for my heart's cry. Thank you, Lord. You know what our hearts are crying out. You know if we had a thousand tongues in a million years, we could never sing your praises enough. We could never thank you enough for your faithfulness. We could never describe how awesome, how mighty, how trustworthy, how faithful, how great is our God. Yet, Lord, take this. Take this sacrifice of praise. Take this little offering from this little class of united hearts that love you so, and to know what we're pouring out to you is our all in all. Lord, you have been found faithful. You've been found true. You have given us your word to, to illuminate us, to educate us, to guide us, to lead us, to give us the purpose for our lives. Lord, if anyone in here and doesn't know their purpose, doesn't know you as personal Savior and Lord, I pray you'll tug at their heart story right now. At this very moment, they will realize you made them. You made them fearfully, you made them wonderfully, and you made them to fit into today's date. And you, Lord God, for all who will call you by your name, allow you to be God in our lives, that you have a future, you have a plan, you have a hope, you have eternity set for us. And it is. Thank you. Praise you, our holy God. You can be trusted. And Lord, I pray, any who entered into this class with anything on their hearts, let them just rejoice that you are taking it, molding it, making it, and fitting it perfectly in time and in space and for our best good because nothing can separate us from your love. Nothing can stop your plan. Nothing is greater than our God. With you on our side, go the out the giant falls, no matter who that giant is, finances, job, future, whatever, Lord, you are greater, you are more mighty, you are more awesome, you are in control, and thank you that you gave us Daniel's prophecy that we can know the future. <coughs> Lord, I love knowing the last chapter, and I know those on your side will win. <laughs> Praise you, thank you, hallelujah. Bless each one. Take them safely through this next sevens and bring them back. That together we can sit at your feet again. Mm -hmm. 
be in the throne room like we are right now. Hear your voice. Know your will and know your way. Thank you, Lord. Your ways are higher than our ways, your thoughts than our thoughts. Thank you. We praise you and we who know you give you that control. Lord, guide us, use us, and thank you for blessing us. In the name of our mighty Savior, our mighty God. Yahweh Yira, our provider, El Shaddai, our all nourisher, we say, praise you, Yeshua Jesus. Thank you. Amen and amen. Mm -hmm. I'm sorry. 402, I think of I hate clocks on earth. I'm thrilled there's no clocks in heaven. <laughs> but we need the clocks so we know March 15th.